NATO says Afghanistan and Russia are now its top priorities under its new leadership. But what will it take for the organization to deliver on such thorny issues? And how efficient will its so-called new strategic concept be? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Lauren Taylor. NATO has a new Secretary General. The former Danish Prime Minister, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, took over the post this week. He's already been addressing questions on the major conflicts that NATO is involved in, as well as some of the organization's sensitive international relationships. The challenges he's highlighted include NATO's tentative relations with Russia and its neighbours. He's also said he understands the need for NATO to develop stronger relations with the Muslim world. But at the top of his list of priorities is Afghanistan. NATO has been involved in the conflict for six years. But the rising number of civilian casualties has led to resentment towards NATO forces in the country. The new Secretary General says he would like to see NATO hand over security to the people of Afghanistan. I believe that during my term as NATO Secretary General, Afghans must take over lead responsibility for security in most of their country. Let me be clear, I say lead responsibility for the Afghans. NATO must and will be there in support. Let no Taliban propagandist try to sell my message as a run for the exit. It is not. Well, joining us now are our guests in Washington, D.C., Doug Ban Bando. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. That's a think tank focusing on issues of public policy and peace. In London, Daniel Korski, a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And in Kuala Lumpur, Professor Indajit Palmer. He's head of politics at the University of Manchester in the U.K. If I can uh, start with you, Daniel Korski, that uh, idea of giving the lead uh, responsibility to the Afghans, how quickly can that be achieved uh, under Rasmussen? It's going to take a long time, and the real problem for NATO isn't so much whether NATO can hand over responsibility to the Afghan forces, but whether NATO is, in fact, handing over responsibility to the United States Army. And so the real challenge for Rasmussen is going to be twofold, both dealing with that, that longer-term handover to the Afghan side, but also making sure that as the U.S. surges its military uh, troops, in particular into the south and east, that other NATO allies continue to be engaged uh, in the struggle. Um, if I could bring you in, Doug Bondo, on that very issue of um, the imbalance between, or the perceived imbalance certainly, but of, of the U.S. and NATO uh, in Afghanistan, a lot of the European countries have actually been qu quite keen not to send any more troops. Can Rasmussen persuade them to do that, to, to increase their, their commitment to Afghanistan? I think he's going to have a very hard time. You know, with German elections upcoming, I mean, this is a, uh, you know, a very unpopular stand within Europe. The Europeans don't see a great need to be involved. Many of the forces that are there already have limitations or caveats on the use of those forces. It's going to be very hard to convince the Europeans to put more forces in when many of the European people, as opposed to their governments, just don't see the necessity in terms of their interests. Indigit Palmer, um, do you think that he's going to... How is he going to sell that, then, in, in, in that case, to, um, to NATO countries, that the idea of you know, participating more in, in Afghanistan? Well, it's going to be a very difficult thing to sell. Um, I'm not really sure how he's going to sell it. Um, there are other factors involved as well. You know, the economic and financial crisis that countries find themselves in can be added to the, uh, the unpopularity of the wars uh, within public opinion. So he's going to have to try to persuade them that uh, if they want to inter um, have influence in the world alongside the United States, uh, then they may uh, be called upon to make some sacrifices. So um, actually buck up public opinion and, uh, and take it on uh, for the kind of the, the longer term uh, power of uh, those forces in the world. Uh, Indrajit Palmer, just staying with you, that this, idea, this message that uh, the mission is crucial for European security by preventing Afghanistan from becoming what he calls a grand central station of international terrorism, does that message play with public opinion? It may well play with public opinion to a certain extent, but uh, I suspect it will depend upon the uh, concrete threats that the public uh, perceive. Um, so the levels of um, alert and uh, fear and anxiety will have to be considerably higher than they may be at the moment for them to take it more seriously. Uh, Doug Bando, do you think NATO's survival depends on uh, European countries committing more to Afghanistan, or is it not as drastic as that? 
Well, it's certainly very important because the question becomes, what is NATO's role? If NATO is not willing to come together on a mission like this, you know, what will it do? What roles will it uh, he'll fulfill? I think this goes to the larger issue of the European vision of the world and the European Union, the desire for a separate defense identity. Now, the European Union and, and Europeans have focused more on economic and diplomacy, less on the military. I think the challenges of the European people willing to fund and willing to create and support military action, you know, that gives the Europeans a larger stake militarily in the world. If they won't do it in Afghanistan, I'm not sure where they're willing to do it at. And then the NATO becomes very unbalanced. If, quite frankly, uh, on this side of the ocean, the question becomes, what's in it for America? You know, the U.S. Uh, you know, should defend uh, the Europeans. What will the Europeans do in terms of, you know, perceived military interests, uh, you know, supporting the United States? So I think if not survival, it's certainly a very serious challenge. Uh, Daniel Korski, would you agree with that assessment? Of, uh... I don't think it's so straightforward as to say the Europeans as against the Americans. I mean, in the, in the south of Afghanistan, there's a sort of minor coalition, if you will, a, coalitions, a coalition of the willing inside NATO that also consists of a number of European countries, including the Brits, the Danes, the Dutch, and so on. Um, so I don't think it's as straightforward as to say the Europeans aren't willing to fight the Americans. Or, but there's clearly a division inside Europe about how serious hard power, military power is, and, and where in the world uh, the Europeans collectively want to project that power. We're seeing mixed signs. On the one hand, the Germans seem very reluctant, particularly in the run-up to their general election later this year, to commit more troops. But we did see um, recently the Spanish prime minister indicate that he would be willing to send more troops to the west of Afghanistan. So it's not quite a... a, a, a a clear picture. It's not quite U.S. and Europe, and it's not quite the U.S. that wants to fight and the Europeans who do not. But there is a serious conversation to be had with NATO's European allies about the extent to which they want to contribute to this military effort. Indrajit Palmer, um, in terms of contribution to the military effort, does it, um, does selling it as, as perhaps, you know, people to train the Afghan army and the Afghan police uh, work better in terms of getting people to commit troops uh, and, you know, people on the ground rather than it, uh, these people being part of a sort of a, a strictly military operation? And is that part of NATO's role? Well, certainly within public opinion, uh, various segments of public opinion, I suspect that training and uh, a training uh, of the uh, Afghan military would be less unpopular because it would suggest there's a long-term strategy to Af uh, to ensure that the Afghan military itself takes care of security internally. Um, I suspect that will play uh, much more easily with public opinion. On the other hand, casualties, um, if they were to occur, uh, would uh, begin to diminish that ardor itself. Going to the point made by one of the other speakers about the uh, relative division of uh, labor and roles between uh, European Union and, uh, and the United States, it seems to me that there is a kind of uh, an effective basis for uh, going forward for these powers because the United States tends to be far more willing and able uh, to uh, engage in military uh, use of military force whereas the Europeans tend to be far more sensitive to uh, issues related to uh, the building of institutions for example. Uh, Doug Bondo, if I could just bring you in on the sort of diff you know, perceived differences between sort of NATO and uh, the US in approach, do you think that the strategy will also now have to involve from the NATO point of view, attempts to, I don't know, talk to the Taliban? Well, in my view, yes. I think the problem we're dealing with is a set of goals. It was relatively easy to throw the Taliban out of power and to get rid of training camps of al-Qaeda. It's extraordinarily difficult to try to build governing institutions, especially central governing institutions in a country like Afghanistan. So I think the U.S. and NATO, I mean, together have to consider the ultimate goal. Is the ultimate goal some kind of a stable central state, uh, you know, focused in a Kabul, or is it some kind of a political accommodation that avoids having Afghanistan as a terrorism central, but nevertheless might have the Taliban or other forces involved that we would prefer not to be involved, but nevertheless might be the most realistic option. I think that has to be on the table within uh, European and U.S. discussions. Okay, just uh, now we'd like to move on to the uh, relations between NATO and Russia, which, of course, Rasmussen talked about. He said he intends to form a true strategic partnership with Russia during his term in office. He stressed that NATO is not an enemy of Russia. On the contrary, he said that they had similar areas of interest and shared security goals. There is clearly scope for us to work together on counterterrorism, on Afghanistan, on piracy, on not...